Hi, in this video we're going to talk about cross-validation, but before we define cross-validation and talk about why we use it, um, let's review some of the modeling we've learned so far on, uh, with a new data set. So the new data set is uh, from the show The Office. This is the American version of The Office that we're going to be working with. And we have data on uh, episodes of The Office and the IMDb ratings for each of the episodes. So the data set we have has 188 rows, which means that there were 188 um, episodes of the show. We have information on the season number, the episode number, the title of the episode, which we're not going to use as one of our predictors, but it's useful to refer to sometimes, the IMDB rating of the episode, which is going to be our outcome variable, the total number of votes uh, for on IMDB for that particular episode, and the original air date. And we have that as year, month, day, uh, and we're going to talk about do we want to use all of that information or, or a portion of that. Um, so let's start by taking a look at the IMDb rating. So here I have a simple histogram of the IMDb ratings. We can see that the shape is unimodal and symmetric. Um, the scores are high, you know, the IMDb scores can range from zero to 10. And here we're seeing that a lot of the, uh, the all of the episodes have um, scores above six. So they range between high sixes and high nines with averaging around eight and a half or so uh, for the ratings. We can also take a look at the relationship between the ratings and the number of votes. So here I'm going to, in addition to uh, making a scatter plot with these two variables, with IMDB rating on the y-axis, since it's, got, it's my outcome variable, I'm going to color the points by the season number. Remember that's a numerical variable. And then I'm going to jitter my points as well, because there was a little bit of over plotting, and um, add a, a transparency level to it so that we can also see better uh, around the overplotting. So the plot looks something like this. The lighter colors represent later seasons of the show. So we can see that the IMDb ratings are a little bit lower uh, for those episodes than earlier ones, except all the way at the end, uh, we can see um, there's a light blue colored point with you know total number 8,000 votes and a, the highest IMDb rating. Um, we might actually want to take a look at these outliers and for this I'm going to use a new package called ggHighlight which happens to have a function called ggHighlight and that's one of these ggplot2 extension packages. Um, and what it does is basically it allows you to easily highlight particular values. So here I can basically say highlight everything that has total votes more than 4,000. And I'm going to say that for labeling those points that are highlighted, use the title. So this is where having the title of the show might be useful if you know anything about the show. So let's take a look at this um, plot. So we can see that the that one point at the very end with the most votes and the highest rating is the finale of the show, which maybe makes sense. You know, it was a well liked show. So the finale um, ended up uh, being scored highly and got a lot of votes. Um, if you if you've seen The Office, maybe you recognize some of these other episodes. Goodbye, Michael. That probably when Steve Carell was leaving the show is what I'm guessing and then stress relief which I don't really remember which one that was and then we have the dinner party episode as well as one of the outliers we identified I um I really really like that episode because it is um both super uncomfortable and very funny if you happen to like that episode i've linked on the slides to this oral history of the episode uh published on the rolling stone magazine it's a um really fun read and equally uncomfortable as the episode itself but here's an idea so a couple things i wanted to show here is that even though we're not using the titles um as part of our modeling, it's useful to have that information to give us some context about our data. And the GG highlight package is uh, very nice for doing this sort of exploratory visualization and highlighting particular things. This is the sort of thing you could do manually, as in you could write uh, ggplot2 code for doing this sort of annotation as well. But why not use a package that easily does that for you? Uh, we can also take a look at the relationship between IMDb ratings and seasons. So here I'm going to use a box plot and I'm ba uh, even though season was a categorical variable, I'm going to use it as a factor um, so that my um, 
um, x-axis can have um, uh, different boxes for each of the seasons. And then I'm also going to, in addition to using a box plot, add a jitter to this as well. So let's take a look at this plot. Um, so we can see basically here that um, each of the seasons, uh, we're kind of seeing a dip around season uh, eight to nine. And I think those are the uh, seasons where there was a cast change. So Steve Carell was no longer on the show. So maybe, maybe that has something to do with that. But we can basically see that the show didn't start off very, very strong, but then it gained popularity. So seasons two through uh, six are doing really well. And then in the last season, we have lots of variability, probably because as the show is nearing the end perhaps there was um you know more interest in the show as well and more people watching it probably translates to uh, more votes on imdb as well okay so now let's uh look into now that we've gotten a little bit of a sense of these data let's uh get to modeling as usual we're going to start our modeling with creating an initial split of training and testing data so for that i'm going to start by setting a seed and we've talked about this notion of setting a seed uh a couple times but let's review it one more time basically what we're doing here is that we are going to randomly split our data into two portions training and testing and when we do this we don't just take the top um in this case three quarters of the data to be training and then the bottom quarter of the data to be testing the reason why we don't want to do that is that we want a random sample of our data and in this particular case it's i think even more clear why we would want a random uh partition our data remember is ordered by season and then episode so if there are season effects for ratings which we saw that there very well might be and then you were to take the top three quarters of your data to be training that's going to be very different than the bottom quarter of your data that you're using for testing especially in this case where we have cast change as well that may have actually uh, contributed uh, potentially to uh, ratings of the show so what we do is we want to do a random sample. So that's one thing, but what about setting the seed? When we're set, uh, taking a random sample, we want to do it in a way that's reproducible. As in, if I take a random sample and obtain some results, and then I share my code with you, you should be able to get to the same random sample as well. That doesn't make that sample non-random. It just makes that particular random sample identifiable and reproducible. So what setting a seed does is basically, it's almost like, um, uh, earmarks this so it sets a starting point for the pseudo random generator that R is using in order to do the random sampling or in this case the random partition. So the number you put in here really doesn't matter, um, but it's important that you record that in your code so that your uh, code can be reproducible. We're going to use the initial split um, function uh, from tidy models and it to split our data set that was called office ratings. The if you look at the help file for the initial split function, you'll see that the proportion for a split between training and testing is three quarters by default. So 75 percent of your data for training and 25 percent of your data for testing. We're going to stick with the default default. So I haven't um, mentioned a different proportion here. So this is the split object and using this, we can extract out the training data that's gonna be 141 rows and the testing data that's gonna be 47 rows. So roughly three quarters to a quarter of my data. And you can see that these have the same number of columns. So to get these two numbers, I'm using the dim function, uh, which is the dimensions. And it uh, gives us the number of rows followed by the number of columns, the number of columns are not only same between your training and testing, but they're also the same as your original data set. And the number of rows, sorry, that's the number of columns, and the number of rows is higher for the training data than for the testing data. And the sum of these two numbers make 188, which was our original sample size. So we have our partitions and we're really going to put our testing data in our pocket and not touch it until we're ready uh, with a model that we've trained on the training data. We start by specifying a model. My outcome variable is continuous. That's the IMDB score. So it's not a binary outcome. It's a continuous numerical outcome. So I'm going to use a linear regression. 
Now, so far, we've really only talked about linear regression and logistic regression. So the decision for us in the context of this course is simple. If we have a continuous outcome, we're using a linear regression. If we have a, um, a binary outcome, we're using a logistic regression. Are there other models that we could conceivably use? Absolutely, there are. And before we wrap up the course, we will say more about, um, you know, what these types of models are, but we're not going to go into the details of them. So for now, our decision process is a little bit simpler. Um, we have a continuous outcome. We're going to use a linear regression. So we specify our model and set our engine. And I'm going to save that um, object with um, the uh, suffix underscore mod for the model. So that's going to be something I'm going, to, that's going to become part of my workflow. So specifying the model is my step one. Then I want to build a recipe. And we've talked about recipes previously, but I want to, uh, there are a couple new things that I'll highlight here and then also review a couple things we've already seen. So our recipe starts with our formula. And basically what we're saying is we want IMDB rating as our outcome variable, tilde, so versus everything else. That's what this uh, dot stands for. And our data comes from the uh, training data set, the office train. Now remember that in our data set, uh, we have many variables that we are going to use as predictors, but we also have that title variable, which we don't really want to use as part of our predictors, because what would it mean to predict the score from the title? We have a different title for every single episode, and we're not doing any sort of like, what's the sentiment of the words and titles? So just that character string is not useful for us. I could do one of two things. I could actually select out that variable to begin with from both my training data set and my testing data set, but then I couldn't get away with using this period. Um, I would have to actually um, write out all of the variables that I want or uh, subtract the ones that I don't want. So one thing you can do in this recipes uh, steps is actually update the role of a particular variable. So here I'm using the function update role and I'm saying that I wanna update the role of the variable title from my data set. And the new role that I want it to have is ID. So by default, all of the variables have, um, when I've used this period here, all of the variables in my data will have the role predictor. And what I'm saying is I wanted to have something else. So ID basically saying that I'm going to use these to identify my, uh, to identify rows in case I need to refer back to them, but it's not going to be part of my predictors. Um, the roles can take on um, whatever character string you want, but the words predictor and outcome are special in the sense that if you update the role of a variable to be predictor, that means now you're making it one of your uh, predictors in your model. And if you update the role of a variable to be outcome, that becomes your outcome. Everything else is more like record keeping, so I could have called it ID with capital letters, ID with small letters, whatever. It's really meant to say not a predictor. So I'm going to update the role of the title variable to be not a predictor, but I'm keeping it around because maybe I want to look to see, you know, how my favorite episode dinner party did at the end. Next, we're going to de uh, deal with the air date. Um, the air date was in the format of year, month, day. Um, and the year really is going to be telling of the season. So I don't think the year information is all that useful for me when I already have the season. Seasons do span calendar years, but still, um, I'm not, I don't think I'm going to get more information uh, from that. If anything, the thing that's probably interesting is, is it an earlier season or a later season as opposed to is it an earlier year or a later year? But the month might be interesting. You know, um, there are, um, especially for his shows in the US, there tends to be particular episodes for like Thanksgiving or Christmas or Valentine's Day. The Valentine's Day episodes of The Office are notoriously uncomfortably funny. Um, so maybe there is something about that month we want to capture. Um, so what I'm going to say is that I'm going to do a step where I extract the month of error date and only use that information. So for that, we're going to use the step date function we've seen previously on the error date variable. And as the feature, I'm only extracting the month. Um, 
uh, I'm not really interested in other things like day of week or something because chances are the show aired on the same day every week. Once I do that, I'm going to remove the original air date variable because I don't really want that full thing in there anymore. I just want the month information. And then since now I have created a new variable that has the word month in it, uh, in its label, um, a categorical variable, so something like January, February, so on and so forth, I'm going to create dummy variables for that. So what that does is it expands our data uh, where instead of having a single categorical variable called air date month, we're going to have things like air date uh, February, March, April, so on and so forth with January being the uh, baseline level since that's the first one that comes up. So we're making uh, dummy variables for those. And finally, uh, this is a step that we almost always do, which is removing the zero variance predictors. Um, so uh, I'm saying do the step ZV for zero variance and remove all predictors that have zero variance. Um, so that's basically our um, recipe. Uh, outline and I'm going to save that as office underscore uh, rec for recipe and this is the output of that recipe so it's not been applied to the data set it's just there again to become a part of our workflow so that we can fit this model um, and it basically tells us that I have one outcome uh, that's going to be the IMDB rating four predictors and one ID variable in my data set. Um, we're doing something with uh, date features from the air date variable and then deleting that variable. And then we're creating dummy variables for the uh, predictors that contain the word month in their title. And then we're removing the zero variance variables as well. All right, I have my model, I have my recipe. Time to put them together in a workflow. So I start with the workflow function. I say I want to add the model, Office Mod. I want to add a recipe, Office Rec. And then that creates a workflow for me. Why do I want to do this organization ahead of time? It's a lot of work to just fit the model. Um, but the reason is that now that we have this saved, we can fit it on the training data, do whatever we want to do with it. And then when time comes to prediction, we can then fit it on the prediction date on the testing data as well. So we won't have to repeat what we did again for the testing data. So it's a lot of upfront cost to set these out in a particular way and build this workflow, but then you get to reuse it over and over. All right. So this output, basically this workflow output looks something like this something like this. It says that we have a preprocessor recipe, so meaning that preprocess these data before you fit the model. And when you're fitting the model, use a linear regression. The recipe has four steps. These are the steps that we had outlined. And the model we're using is a linear regression model uh, with the computational engine LM. This is really not telling us anything we didn't know, but it's useful to see how all of this information is organized together. All right, we're ready to fit the model. We start with our uh, workflow that we had set, the office workflow, and then we pipe that into the fit function and we say the data we want to fit the model to is the training data, okay? Now let's take a look at this output. So I've tidied the model output. Um, maybe we can take a look to see what these um, uh, estimates are telling us. So for example, season has a negative, um, uh, slope coefficient, which basically tells me that for each um, unit season is higher. So as we go later in the seasons, the predicted IMDB score decreases on average by 0.0297. Um, episode numbers have a positive slope. So that's within a season. Uh, we're seeing that maybe later episodes are rated higher than earlier episodes. And total number of vo votes also has a, a positive uh, slope as well, which basically means if a show got more votes, it was also rated higher. And that's not necessarily always intuitive. It could be the case that if people hate an episode, they're likely to rush to IMDb and score it really low. But I think what we're seeing here is that what drives people perhaps to go rate an episode is the fact that they like the episode. So if there are more votes, the rating is uh, likely to be higher. Now, 
a quick comment about the magnitudes of these numbers. You know, this negative 0.0297, uh, positive 0.0453, and positive 0.000510. These are on different scales. And the reason why they're on different scales is that our data is on different scales. Remember, season uh, ranges from one to nine, right? There were nine seasons of the uh, show episodes range from something maybe up to 20 or so per season and total number of votes uh, ranges from what did we see from zero to eight thousand so um, they're on very different scales so one thing we could have done in our recipe uh, steps is also to normalize these data so that our numerical predictors could have similar scales that's something that we might come back to later but for the time being, we're going to leave that alone because our goal here wasn't necessarily to compare these uh, coefficients to each other, to say things like which one seems to be, um, seems to have a higher association with the IMDB score. So since we're not trying to do that, it's okay to leave them alone, but it is useful to know that we can't just compare these slope coefficients, the magnitudes of them to each other. It wouldn't be comparing apples to apples unless you normalize your numerical predictors to be on the same scale to begin with. We can also see how the dummy variables work. Uh, so January is our baseline level. So the February episodes are uh, seem like they have higher ratings. I'm really going to guess that that has something to do with Valentine's Day. Um, March and April, slightly lower and then higher for the others. And we also are seeing that we're missing some months here. So May is here, but June, July, and August are not here. And that's probably because we had no shows during that time. Uh, TV seasons tend to kind of die down. Over the summer, there tends to be other shows um, where people go to the beach or something over the summer. And then they come back to regular programming uh, come September. So when we did that zero variance step to take out uh, any columns with zero variance, if there were columns created for June, July, and August, those would have gone away because they would have had all zeros to begin with. All right, we fit a model. We're seeing uh, our results, but are, do we believe this model? How do we evaluate it? So we can go ahead and make predictions for our training data to begin with so that we can figure out how off we are in our predictions. So I'm going to use the predict function for this. Um, the model that I just created is called office fit and the data that I want to do the prediction on is the training data to begin with. And then I'm going to take that information. So that would just give me the predicted values and the raw values. Uh, or the actual observed values. And then I want to bind uh, the columns, um, the IMDB rating from the original data and the title as well, just so I can see what the titles are. So for example, for the pilot, the, or the score is IMDB rating is 7.6, uh, but the model predicts that it would be 8.48. OK, that's basically what this is telling us. Um, the next episode was Diversity Day. The original uh, the observed score was 8.3. The model predicts it's 8.45. So doing a little bit better job with the second one than it's doing with the first one. We can go and compare these numbers. The next one, the Alliance, we're like almost hitting it the nail on the head, 8.1 and 8.1. But we know that our job in modeling and doing prediction is not to try to accurately predict any given data point, but instead to, um, on average, reduce our error as much as possible, our prediction error as much as possible. So one of the things we can take a look at in terms of uh, evaluating the performance of this model is our R squared value. Remember that that's the percentage of the variability in the IMDB ratings that's explained by our model. A function we can use for just getting the R squared out is RSQ. So we basically give it the, um, the prediction uh, data frame that we created and then tell it the truth. The observed data is in the IMDB rating column and the estimate is in the dot pred column. So that's really just saying, take a look at what we just created and then we're telling it where the truth is IMDB rating versus where the predicted values are under dot pred. And it calculates the R squared for us. I get uh, 0.533, 
Uh, what does that number mean? That means that um, this model, uh, we, we're able to explain 53.3% of the variability in IMDb ratings of the Office um, episodes using this model. Now, our models with high or low R squared more preferable. And we would like to explain as much variability as possible. So we would prefer to have higher R square. Uh, 0.533 not great not terrible kind of middle of the road we're not doing great are we surprised the variables we used are what season what episode the month it aired number of votes i mean probably what makes people love or hate an episode is something more than just those right so we're put you know one of the things i hypothesized was that maybe month will be useful because there tends to be certain themes to episodes and uh with particular themes some of them tend to be funnier than others but there's probably a lot more going on there in terms of you know who was talking a lot uh what the topic was about so on and so forth um potentially what else was going on in the world when that show aired uh so it is not too surprising that we're not doing a great job with our prediction here with just the variables that we have used in our model um Another uh, evaluation metric is called RMSE. So this is an alternative model performance statistic and one that's used pretty commonly, and it stands for root mean square error. So what are we doing here? The formula basically says that for each row, uh, take a look at your observed value of your outcome. So that's YI, subtract from that the predicted value, for that particular observation. So that's y hat i. So we take the difference between, that's our prediction error. We square that number, and we square that number both to get rid of the negative in it and also to uh, amplify the um, contribution of the uh, observations where our prediction error is higher because the squared values are then going to be higher. And then we sum these up over our whole data set or over our entire uh, training data set in this case. And then divide it by the number of observations in that data set where we're fitting the model. And finally, take the square root. We ultimately are taking the square root because we want our RMSC to be on the same scale as our outcome variable. It'll make things easier to compare later uh, once we see the value of the RMSC, what that number might mean. So we square it to get rid of um, the negative sign and also to amplify the effect of the larger values, but then we undo the square at the end so that we can go back to the units we're used to working with. So uh, we can calculate RMSC the same way we have calculated R squared, this time using the RMSC function. And again, we give it the, um, the data set uh, that we created with our predictions. Um, we tell it what the truth is and we tell it what the predicted values are. And you can imagine this is a, actually a simple calculation. I mean, we could go through by hand and calculate these differences between yi and y hat i, square them, sum them over, divide them by n, take the square root and basically arrive at this number. The number turns out is 0 0.350. Unlike R squared, where I had an interpretation on a percentage uh, basis, like the percentage of the variability in the outcome explained by the model, this number on its own is not really interpretable. But the magnitude of it in comparison to other things can be informative. So what do we think? Are models with high or low RMSC uh, more preferable? In this case, we would prefer models with low RMSC because that means that the differences between uh, your YI and your Y hat I are smaller. Now, obviously another thing that would make your RMSC low is N being high, but that's why we don't really worry about the number, um, the value of the RMSC on its own. We don't have like thresholds that we uh, compare it against because uh, the sample size will also drive that number. Um, but what we can do is if we're evaluating different models for the same data set where N is going to be the same, then the effect of that N on the RMSC is going to be same across the various models you're uh, comparing to each other. And really the differences in RMSC you're seeing are going to be coming from the numerator, which is the more interesting part here because that's the part about the prediction error.
So yeah, we do like models with low RMSC, but we don't really quantify how low is low just by looking at a, a single number. Um, so in this case, then how do we interpret this number, this 0 0.350? How do we determine if that's considered low or high in context of our data? Um, one thing we can do is we can take a look at our original data. So I've started with the uh, data that I fit my model to, the office train data. And then I have created summary statistics for the minimum and the maximum value for this. So the minimum value of the IMDb ratings is 6.8 and the maximum value is 9.7. So our scores range between 6.8 and 9.7 and our average prediction error is 0.35. So in that case, we can basically think about it as they range between 6.8 and 9.7, almost a three point range. And we are on average off by 0.35. That doesn't seem too bad, right? So our, if that number was much higher, like three, if the, our prediction error was almost as large as the raw, um, the range of our original observed data, then we would say, well, we're doing a pretty terrible job predicting. If that number was much smaller, we would say we're doing a pretty good job predicting. And I would say here, we're kind of uh, middle of the way. It's not too bad for sure. It's also not fantastic. But who really cares about predictions on training data? You know, um, we really wanna be making instead predictions for our testing data. So, um, here, what we're doing is we're going through and applying the exact same code we developed earlier, except uh, this time the data set we're applying it to is our testing data, because really we already trained the model on our training data, then we don't really need to make predictions on that as well. That's not going to be as informative. Let's see how the model does with new data, like truly new data, meaning the testing data that we had put in our pocket earlier on, we now get to take a look at it. So we can, um, in fact, um, take a look to see how well we're doing in terms of our predictions. You can see that these are different episodes uh, because our testing data is a different subset of our data. And we can see how well do it we're doing one by one, but we can also take a look at these performance statistics we've talked about, such as the RMSC and the R squared. So using the same uh, code we've uh, used before, except here we're using the testing predictions uh, for calculating the RMSC and R squared. And the values we get are 0.482 and 0.496. Instead of focusing on these values in isolation, what we really want might wanna do is see how they compare to the training data. Did we do just as well on our testing data as we did on our training data? Well, let's take a look. So this is the information you've seen already presented all on one slide. For our training data set, our RMSC was 0.35 and for our testing, it was 0.482. So it's lower for training. So we did better with our training data than our testing data. That doesn't really sound very good. We expect to do better with our training data. We would like to do equally well at least. Um, for our R squared, our training R squared is 0.533, our testing R squared is 0.496. Again, they're not hugely different from each other, but we are doing better with our training, so R squared is higher for our training data. So what this is telling me is that you do a better job when you train with the data than uh, with new data, which is not that great. So what's happening here? The training set really does not have the capacity to be a good arbiter of performance. It's not an independent piece of information. Predicting the training set really can only reflect what the model already knows, because that's what we train the model on in the first place. So as an analogy, you might think about this. Suppose you give a class a test and then give them the answers and then provide the same test to them again. The student scores on the second test do not accurately reflect what the students know about the subject because these scores would probably be higher than their result on the first test because they've already seen the results. So trying to evaluate the performance on training data is kind of like this story and it's not something that we like to do. It's not something very informative. So now that we've identified the problem that evaluating model performance on training data is not a good idea, um, 
we should uh, offer a suggestion and that is cross validation, which is what we said we're going to talk about at the beginning of the video. And it took us a while to get here, but we got a chance to review uh, modeling and then also motivate uh, why we might want to learn about cross validation. So how does cross validation work? And here I'm more specifically talking about V fold cross validation, or you might also have heard of this uh, referred to as K fold cross validation. Um, I think that's the entry on Wikipedia, for example, what we're doing here is that we shuffle our data, so our training data, into v partitions. So v is some number, um, an integer. And then we use one partition for validation and the remaining v minus one partitions for training. And then we repeat it v times. So if we were to kind of uh, put this into a figure, so we have our training data, which was at 75% of our data to begin with, and then our testing data that we're not touching just yet. So let's set aside the testing data. We do cross validation on our training data. The goal here is that instead of predicting the entire training data to evaluate model performance, we want to do our prediction on only a subset of it. And we want to do it in a way where we do it multiple times and then average uh, the performance um, over the multiple folds. So that's our training data. Imagine, so we're going to do five fold cross validation in this case. So that's why I've split my training data into five. Um, and in each one of my folds, I have one partition that's the validation that's going to be set aside. We're going to train a model on the rest, and then we're going to um, apply that model to our validation data set to get something like an RMSC or an R squared that we want to store in our pocket and then go through each of the folds one by one. So this is kind of the approach of cross validation. And you can imagine that even though in this um, uh, diagram, I have these boxes nicely aligned, really we're randomly sampling for each one of these because we don't want to have just the uh, top half of our or top uh, four fifths of our data going to training and then the remaining to validation. We're actually doing a random sampling into these uh, various partitions. So the way we can do that is using the function called vfold underscore cv. Um, and because we're re doing random sampling, I've set a seed here as well. So basically, this is the same image that we can see here. Um, and on the other side, we're seeing the R code that generates this. So we give it what v is. So in this case, we said that we're going to do five-fold cross-validation. Um, remember, we had 188 data points to begin with. We already set aside 25% of them and we're left with 141 in our training data set. Now we're saying we get to use four fifths of those data for um, training and then the remainder for validation in each one of our folds. So if that V was higher, then we would be left with a lot fewer observations in each. So at some point, uh, that parameter of V is going to depend a little bit on your data set as well. So you may see in other examples like tenfold cross validation, but the reason why we didn't do that here is that our data set isn't that large. So what vfold cv function does is it basically organizes your data for, in this case, fivefold cross validation, since we've set v equal to five, and then it basically gives you the split. So in fold one, we had 112 observations in training and 29 in uh, validation, fold 213 uh, versus 28, so on and so forth, okay? Now, what's next from here? Um, we are basically going to fit the model five times. So really, or actually train the model uh, five times. And then for each one of the times that we train it, we fit it to the validation data to obtain some performance statistics like RMSC and R squared. Um, we could write some code to do this, right? We can really randomly sample our data, keep track of what we're doing, um, fit a model, and then um, train a model on the training data and then fit it to our validation data and obtain these performance statistics. But uh, since we already have our workflow, right, which uh, has identified our model and our recipe that we had developed previously, since we already have it ready from before, and we have our folds now nicely organized in this data frame that we um, created with vfold cv, 
we can use a new function called fit resamples to do all of this. So what this GIF is basically showing us that we're doing this five times, this function actually does. You can imagine that running this function takes a little bit longer than running uh, fitting an individual model because it is actually under the hood fitting all of these models, just doing that all for you and storing the information in a way and it's going to be easy to access. And then we're going to show some functions for accessing the particular pieces of information uh, from this, because we're not necessarily interested in every single uh, slope estimate from here, for example. We really wanna know on average, how are we doing with our models? So fit resamples basically does cross validation the way we have outlined it over the folds that you have. So if you have already stored your fold as a data frame to begin with, then we can apply it to that. And the results are again stored in a tibble um, that has some uh, list columns as well that we're going to be able to um, extract that information out with some new functions. One of those functions is collect metrics. So really what we wanted to do, remember we went down this path because we said we don't wanna calculate things like RMSE or R squared on our training data. Um, and we don't yet wanna to touch our testing data either, right? That's holy. We wanna to only touch it when we know that we're doing a good job with our model, but how do we evaluate if our model is good um, if we only have the training data? Well, we um, give up a little bit more of our model, of our training data for validation, do the cross validation step, and then we can take a look at the measures like RMSE and R squared. So what these numbers are, are basically the average RMSC and R squared values from the five uh, times that we've actually done this process from the five folds. Um, and we can take a look um, at actually the raw data as well. So the function was collect metrics and by default it calculates the summaries. So it summarizes them for us. But if you do summarize equals false, you can get the RMSC and R squared from each one of your folds. So this is fold one, this is fold two. Um, I can just organize this data into a nice uh, table. Uh, using a pivot function. So here we can basically see what the RMSEs for each of the folds look like and what the R squares for each of the folds look like. We can see that the R squared kind of jumps around a little bit, right? For fold two, we did so much better than for um, fold four, for example. But ultimately what we're interested in is on average, how did we do with our data? So once again, to answer this question about on average, how did we do, we might compare the stats from our cross-validation RMSC with uh, our outcome variable from our training data, which is the IMDB scores. Remember that our IMDB scores range from 6.8 to 9.7, um, and they had a standard deviation, say, of 0.514. And in our case, uh, our RMSC ranges from 0.3 to 0.40. Uh, 0.438. So again, it's smaller than the range of our data. Um, and uh, they're, they're variable, but not as variable as our data to begin with. So this might be one way of putting into perspective, how are we doing? So this would tell us, are we at all happy with our model or not? If these numbers are, if our um, average RMSC from our cross validation was say on the order of three, which is just a, just the range of our outcome variable, I think we would say this model is entirely useless. There's no reason to keep going with this model and waste our test data set on it. We should build a different model and see um, if we do better. And a different model could mean a different set of variables or different model could mean um, use something other than linear regression. Maybe that's just not capturing the relationship here. Um, in this case, we might say it's doing fine maybe, but we probably wanna compare it to something else to see which one we like better. Um, so what would be next? If you're happy with the model that you have, um, what would be next is would be to uh, test it against the testing model and see how you do. And again, at that point, um, you probably have a couple candidate models that you've gone through this process with, and then you uh, test them uh, on the testing data to ultimately decide which one of these models uh, are doing a better job predicting new data as opposed to predicting data that you have trained with.